Okay, uh, good evening, <laughs> and welcome to Heritage Baptist Church. If you will, stand with me and sing number one in the book, My Savior's Love. We're going to sing first, second, and fourth verse. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned to clean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song will ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Sing number four then. It don't matter. He took my sin and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransom in glory, His face I at last shall see. Will be my joy to the age to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Bob, would you lead us in opening prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for what a great God that you are, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here in your house today, Lord, to worship you, Lord. Please give us the right heart, the right attitude, Lord, to do that. And uh, Lord, help us, Lord, to encourage one, one another, Lord, to, to build each other up, Lord, and uh, just help us, Lord, to love each other, Lord. And we love you, and we pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing number, uh, what? Number 10. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm old tonight, so I, I can get away with this tonight, okay? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Decided to follow Jesus, no running back, no turning back. Though no one joined me, still I will follow. Though no one joined me, still I will follow. Though no one joined me, still I will follow. No turning back. Before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Preacher announcements? All right. I guess you're wondering what I'm doing with my phone. Oh, good evening. Glad to have you here this evening with us. And we want you to um, think about it. I have my phone out, and you're wondering what I'm doing. And uh, we have uh, gotten real close with our missionary on the Navajo Nation, Justin Barnett. And he's doing really good out there. He's, we've been able to uh, uh, help them in a lot of different ways and do some stuff. We're going to do that also for Christmas, if, if you would like to help us. But uh, he's sending me things to go with. He had... Uh, 15 riders on the bus today, I mean on the van today, bringing them in. 
And that's pretty exciting for them. They got a new family that's moved in and outside the reservation. Um, they're, they're wanting to come and help them. They had 20 in their adult service today. That's the most he's ever had. We had 20 in, 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 in with our adult service today, and God blessed us with some old members that used to come who came back. And we also had five more kids in our kids group. And, uh, and uh, uh, there, um, <clears throat> he gives some personal information. And they got, um, uh, if you've been looking, I don't know, most of you probably don't get the pictures that I get, but they, uh, I'll give this to Brother Mike if he wants to put it on there and you can show it. But it's, um, they've got their inside, they had work to, to dry in the church building and they've now they're working on the inside. They've got three of their classrooms insulated and sheetrock on the inside and it's kind of, it looks starting to look like a real church building and so they're excited and he keeps sending me pictures and you won't be able to see this from here but it's got a it's the children's church and there must be one two three four five six seven eight nine there's like 12 or 13 young people there as well in the class and so he's pretty excited about that and you just keep praying for him he's i, I promise you he's he's excited because just somebody contacts him and says, hey, this is going really well out there. And he's got a good home church, too. It's also here in Arlington. And they've done really well with them. But keep praying. And, uh, you know, we can't go to a lot of overseas countries. Our missionaries are out. But our missionaries at home are still working. That group, the church we have start in Montana last year is doing good. And I'm telling you, that this, just keep asking God to, to use us. And he will. And pray for those missionaries that are out there. I have had no new news. Anybody heard anything new about the the missionary group in Haiti, uh, me neither. So if you find out, just go, will you text me and I'll try to figure out where they are, what it is. If you can figure out anything about them, you'll hear any more news about that. We do have that. I like Bob's announcements last week. Good, good message, Brother Bob. And the singing was good. So that's always great right there. Um, we went to a new church in Hawaii that's uh, over on, a, it's about 20 minutes away. And if, if you're driving through Honolulu, that's about 12 miles, okay? It's just like driving here it is really something, but it's it's kind of elaborate. And how many of you, I can't tell you, because I'm not going to announce the name of the store on the deal, but I promise you, ours look like warehouses there. Theirs look like glass mansions in the downtown, and right downtown. It was really neat stuff. Our churches, you, you pray for the missionary of their month, and that's the Tinkles, missionaries to Dominican Republic. And of course, if you're in this Samaritan's purse, you can, if you are packing your own box, your volleyball stuff is in. If you want to pick it up, or if you want us to put it in, you just got to let me know, and I'll get it over here. And we got a fellowship after church on the 31st. Time change is November the 7th, and we will be doing. And I like this because uh, I know it sounds really kind of like uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but it's our kids love it, and I kind of like it too. And that is, we do the Christmas store for people coming in. My grandkids all love to be here. Even my out-of-state grandkids love to come and be a part of that and, and all that goes with it. So um, you talk to Miss Jana, you can talk to Brenda, you can talk to me, you can talk to any pretty much any of the teachers. They can tell you a little bit more about what we do. We started that years and years ago when Hazel Banfield wanted to do that, and we tried it, and it went over really big. So we're going to keep doing that as long as they enjoy doing it. And you parents will be glad because you're getting all kinds of Christmas gifts that you wouldn't before, even though they probably were yours and you're getting them back. Okay, that's one of the great things, right? And so for those of you who raised kids with nothing finer on Christmas morning than open up a package that had the socks out of your drawer in it, you know. Hey Amen. You remember that? Fine stuff, fine stuff. Let's pray and ask God to bless and thank Father, we thank you for your love to us and thank you for our missionaries, the ones here and the ones around the world. Um, and we're, we're grateful that they have a heart for the people they go to. And Lord, I, I found out a long time ago that most of the missionaries that we have, the ones that have stayed for eight or nine years or 10 years or 30 years, and Lord, we've had two retire this year who have been more than 50 years on the field. And Lord, I pray that you would find someone to fill that vacancy for them. And then Lord, that you would bless their lives as they come home and prepare to do something they've probably never done. And that's take time just to, to do what they want to do. I know they'll find churches to serve you in. But we thank you for their service. We thank you, Lord, for our military. We thank you, Lord, that our military is one of the greatest missionary forces that that we just don't realize what a tremendous missionary effort the military has. It's changed countries like Korea and Japan and other places where they go. Thank you, Lord, for those Christian men and women in the military that share their, 
faith all around the world every day. We ask you, Lord, to bless both those and the ones that are sent by our church and other churches. We thank you, Father, for a part that we get to have in it. And we ask your blessings on it all in Jesus' name. Amen. fell in love with Jesus I gave him all my heart and I thought I couldn't love him more than I did right at the start but now I look back over the mountain and the valleys where we've been and it makes me know I love him so much more than I did then and I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I keep falling in love with him over and over again. There's a hand that I hold on to. Through each valley and each trial, there's a shoulder that I lean upon and I face another mile. There's a love that I can depend on that's fresh and new each day. And the joy of my heart is overflowing, that is why I say I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. Keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Amen. Amen and amen. Good scene. Very good. Yes. I listened to the services that the guys did. They did a great job preaching. And the scene was good. I'm telling you. Very good. Got your Bibles. Turn with me first to the book of Genesis, chapter number 5, verse 18. Okay, we're going to talk to you a little bit, and then we're going to go over to the book of Jude. Okay, because I just a couple things I want to explain as we get started. But I'm going to talk to you about the message of Enoch. Now, how many of you have ever heard that there is a book of Enoch? All right. All right. There's a book of almost everything. And uh, if you look through your Bible you will find that there are 20, I've counted, 22 books that are mentioned, written by prophets and other people, and see who, that they never have a Bible. There's not a Bible book in there to, to uh, correspond with. It. David Seer was one of them, and they have, you know, there's different people, and they did not, they didn't, God didn't use their part. He said, well, didn't he like them? I, I don't know the answer to that. 
But I know there's great uh, controversy sometimes about the book of Enoch, that because there is a book of Enoch found, and and people like to kind of mislead you and tell you it was found in the Qumran caves, and it was not. Okay, it was found at another place close to that, but it's it's way later. Um, you can just tell by the way it's written what's happened. Everybody knew it's probably written closer in the time of Jesus than in Enoch, and that's the trouble with that. It says Enoch. We're going to show you in a minute. Jude said he is the seventh from Adam. Okay, if he didn't write it till the time of Jesus, then he's really old. Right? That's what I'm telling you. So here's what we got. If you look with me on this, by the way, let me, can I explain this for you? All right. When you're going through your Bible, and this chapter does that, it picks up the bloodline of Adam. But it stays with the bloodline that leads to, to Christ. All right. I don't know how many children Adam and Eve had. You know, you live almost a thousand years and you'll find that some of these people, guys were 60, 70, 70, 600, 700 years old and still having kids. Okay, this wasn't like the day we live in, all right? And uh, that was a unique experience. And we're going to talk about that through it. It wasn't that they were, when, when Jude in a minute will say he is the seventh from Adam, he's, he's not talking about the seventh guy in the world. He's talking about the seventh guy in the line of Christ from Abraham. There's, pro, there's millions probably out there by that time that, that are out there all over the place. I don't know what happened with it. We don't know how many people died in the flood and none of those things. We don't know how far they went. Uh, the earth didn't break up until we, we get over in, uh, the scripture here, and we, we talk about that a little bit, and I won't get there today, but uh, the, the earth was one piece, and so they were they had gone to all over the world on the, in the continent, and then broke up into what it is now, into what, however many continents they are, and they keep renaming them. I always wish they'd leave it the same name, you know <clears throat> but we got it together. But it's sort of like churches, you know, if you found out that the, the great name for churches has to have a point in it. South Point, North Point, Center Point, Green Point, Blue Point. Have you noticed how popular that is? Love Point, Bad Point, bad, you know, Jump Off the Cliff Point. I don't know all the stuff that goes with it. But I want you to look with me. We'll look at Genesis chapter 5. You're just going to call ours Heritage Point, right? Genesis chapter 5, verse number 18, and we'll start there because we're, we're going to go down. And you've got, you start with Adam, and of course, and you go to Adam, you go to Seth, and then Seth goes to Enos, and we go to Enos, we go to, all right, and I'm going to get all the way down in chapter, verse 18, it says, and Jared lived 162 years, and he begat Enoch, because this is who I want to talk to you about, Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years, and begat sons and daughters. So after he had Enoch, he lived 800 years more, producing children be a lot of people out there, all right? And all the days of Jerry were 960 and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God, and he begat Methuselah 300 years. After he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. So Enoch lives 365 years. And he walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He, he didn't die. God took him out of the world. The word that we use for God, for the other one that's that picture type, is Elijah, and the scripture says he's translated. And you say, well, where are they? God didn't tell me. I don't know where they are. But they're somewhere with God. And... God can do whatever he wants, and I know what he's going to do, some miraculous things. If one of the problems that you say, well, you know, that year, what would be with the body and stuff? Do you not remember what, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, they say, Lord, he's, he's dead four days. He stinketh. He's already rotting. Um, but Jesus raised him from the dead. He seemed okay at the time, right? Yeah, so I thought so. Jerry lived there in the, all the days of Enoch with 360 and five years and he walked with God and he was not for God took him. And then when you move in, the next one is Methuselah and all that lived all, after all that. And I want you to think with me about that and we'll, we'll go through it. 
In the book of Jude, then, all the way over to the book right before Revelation is Jude. It's only one chapter, but I will put down chapter 1 because it's just easier to put it that way. And read chapter number 1 and verse 14 and 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, he was the seventh in the line of Christ, all right, prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all <clears throat> and to convince all that were ungodly among them. Now I want you to look at this ungodly thing. This is, amazes me. Can, uh, convince all the ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed of all their speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, there's a whole bunch of cool things in there, but don't let the, all those ungodly let you miss what's in it. And I want you to look with me in that. And just a couple of things about Enoch. Number one, he's the first prophet mentioned in the scripture. He was the first one that we have a prophecy of. Uh, for some reason, Jude, it must have been real popular among the, the Jews of the time to be able to record people that, that we don't have recorded in our scripture you, we had all kinds of prophets and we had all kinds of people and that did things and said things and prophesied to the people and we don't know their names. Sometimes if you go to the book of Kings, you know one of those prophets that are there by, he was an old prophet and that's it. Don't give his name, doesn't tell you who it is. It was an old prophet, okay? Probably young prophets too and all the other stuff that went with it. God used men and he used people to do magnificent things. So he was the first prophet the book of Jude reminds us he was the seventh from Adam. Genesis tells us he lived a total of 365 years. Now, the seventh from Adam is important. Seven is a completion number. Seven is a completion number. Go through the book of Revelation and read it seven or eight times through and count the number of things that are listed in sevens. All right? There's a lot of them. God does things in sevens. He set the week up to be in sevens. Uh, there's seven feasts in the Jewish calendar year. It just, it just keeps going on and all that goes with it. Sevens, it's a completion number. Actually, it's a perfect completion number. You said he's the seventh from Adam. His father, Jared, outlived him by 435 years because God took him. He was not. Enoch never died. He was translated just like Elijah. And the Bible doesn't say he went to heaven in the chariot of fire like Elijah, just something that says it was not, for God took him. Now, I had a pastor friend of mine that said he used to talk to God all the time, and he could say in the afternoon, he, God found a man like Adam was supposed to be that he could walk and talk to in the, in the end of the day, and said he'd walk, and Enoch walked with God, and he'd say, you know, we'd talk together, and finally they just walk and talk, and thing, until and God said, you know what, why don't you just come home with me tonight? We'll just go. And I, that, wasn't that cool? All right, it's going to be fun for us to be with the Lord. And he, I don't know, I know there's a lot of fear in death. But for a Christian, there shouldn't be. There, there's a lot of things that, that scare me about death. I wonder what's going to happen to people that get left behind. I'm just going to wonder who's going to do the work. When this, when this generations of Christians, and I'm not talking about all you old people, but I'm talking about almost in this, if you take away these generations of people that are in our church, and the young people included in that, <clears throat> what, what kind of Christianity do you think there will be testimony in, in the world? See, it's, if, if everything went by the United States, this rapid decline, it wouldn't take but one generation. And there rose up a new generation who knew not the Lord. Isn't that amazing? So he was taken from the world and just 262 years before, if you count the numbers up, before Noah was born. And so... We also know a lot of other things about him. First of all, we know that Enoch pleased God. You know how I know that? Because it says so in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. It was not found because God had translated him. For before the translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That he pleased God. I'm, I'm amazed at the number of people who, who claim to be Christian who are upset because God is not their personal genie. I want a wish every day and you're supposed to do it. Now, I, 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 want, I want you to understand this, guys. And you say, well, Bob preached a great message about is God good and the suffering that goes on in the world? 
Do you, and, and I've heard a hundred of people who claim to be atheists, they're just wounded deists. You know, they didn't get their way, something happened they didn't like. Uh, somebody, God didn't answer prayers, or some kind of wish they had he didn't do. And so they're just, you know, that's about the most lame, foolish, ignorant thing I can think of. That you're angry at something that you say does not exist. Doesn't that make you a psychotic person? You, by your own mission, you're saying that doesn't exist, but I'm angry at him. I've always wondered that. Every time I get a chance, I tell someone I'm that, okay? But they, they believe in God, but they're just angry at him. But I, I want you to get this God is God. And Brother Bob did a great job preaching last Sunday night. I don't, I'm not going to re preach that. But we live in a world that outside of salvation, we live under a lots of consequences. And we love it. I like it. America is the land of consequences. Do you know that? Our, it was our projection. You could come here. It's the home of the free, the land of the brave. You work hard. You could make it. You could come in here, a, a penniless pauper from some other country, and you could put your nose to the grindstone. And in two generations, you could be like the Trump family. Because they were immigrants. You say, well, well, you know, it doesn't. No, I'm telling you guys. There are consequences. You brush your teeth, they don't all fall out early. There's consequences with that. If you don't stand in the road in the middle of the night in a black sweatshirt and pants, you probably won't get hit as often. Now you, how many of you told your kids, don't get out in that road, you'll get run over? Because there's consequences to that. There's consequences to doing good. There's consequences to doing bad. I've, I've had employers call me and say, preacher, you got any more people like that one that you sent over here? I could use a dozen of those right now. There's consequences to everything. And you're telling me that you're wanting God to allow you to do anything you want to do, but remove the consequences when you disobey. That's foolishness. You know what's, what we've done? You know why our society is in the place it's in right now? We've taken away the consequences for bad actions. Well, it's not fair. He only robbed eight people. Why is he in prison? I, I, I never will forget listening to a little movie clip that's sent out by somebody that I know to me, and it was a mom lamenting that there was not enough gun control because when her son goes out at night to rob, she's scared that some house he's going to rob, that the owner there will have a gun and shoot him. And she prays every night as he's out doing his robbing that he won't get hurt. What are you talking about? Why not tell him to quit robbing and stealing? And stealing? See, well, well, there ought not be any consequences to that. Can I tell you? I don't know anybody. I don't know any thief that wouldn't get angry with you for stealing their stuff. There are consequences to everything. One of the most wonderful things in the whole world is the ability to see consequences that are positive. Would you want those gone too? No. You see, we're not earthworms. There's consequences to what we do. And this guy had a reputation. He pleased God. That takes a consecrated, concentrated effort to please God. First, you got to know what he wants. What does he want? What does he want? I, I was watching the TV show a couple weeks ago. And... He was one of those weird ones, you know, where people are gone for five years and they show back up again. And in the whole thing, it's a, it has Romans 8, 28 all through it. All things work together for good. Like everything has 8, 28 in it. You probably know what I'm talking about. And the lady says this magnificent thing. It says, all things work together for good to them who are the called. And she's in a church saying, praying and, and the priest walks in and she goes, what does it take to be called? That's a good question. What does it take to be called? 
I can tell you what God called Job. He said, I know him. He's good. He'll do what I have, what it is. He's, he's upright. He escheweth evil. He pleased God. Don't get upset with God if you find him all the time. You say, why, why, why aren't I being blessed like all those? Can I tell you something? You want to be blessed. Find it, what it is God wants you to do in your life and do it. You say, well, I don't know what God wants me to do. You're telling me that you don't know any Christian that knows you're supposed to stay in church. You're telling me you don't know any Christian that knows that God said that you're, you, one-tenth of what you have belongs to him and he wants you to give it back as a, as a faith practice. You don't know anybody that knows you're supposed to read their Bible, to study, to show yourself approved under it. See, you know all that stuff. You already know part of what you're called to do. Why would he give you anything else if you're not doing what he's already told you? You thought I was just going to tell you a story, didn't you? Our faith in Jesus' person, position, and work is what saves us from sin. We believe it was the Son of God come into the world in the flesh to die for our sins. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. When we read to you in a little bit in the first scripture verse back there about Jesus, about uh, Enoch, you know what we read about? We read to you about his faith. He believed in God. He had great faith. God told him, you know what's going to happen about, you know, 6,000, 7,000 years from now? I, I, I can do that. I believe that, yeah. You're, somebody this week told me, he said, do you, do you know that there were Christians in Africa within 100 years of Jesus' death? Guys, yeah. Yeah, they were. Do you not remember in the book of Acts in chapter 8, Philip preaching to an Ethiopian eunuch who trusted the Lord as Savior and was baptized and went back? Do you not understand that Judaism was in Africa hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of years before that? Because the Queen of Sheba, which is the same place as Ethiopia, came to see Solomon and took the Judaistic practices back and they've been there for thousands of years. When the first place all these guys went after Jesus left, where did they go to first? They went to the Jewish people. It was Paul's practice to go to the synagogues first and preach the gospel. And so they did in Africa, north, south, east, and west, all over the place. Yeah, there were a lot of Christians there. By the end of the first century, there were a lot of people. On sides that, all those Jews that were scattered abroad, go to the book of Acts again, he said, all they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the gospel. Right? Yeah. You know what took that? They believed it. I found out something. Whatever you believe, you'll practice. If you don't believe it, you won't practice it. Now you say, you know what? How many of you have ever just dreamed of just playing like with a live rattlesnake? You know what we need to do? Well, about years and years ago, there was a traveling group, and the, the guy that was in charge of it was pretty funny. And I won't get into that, but they ended up booking one of those churches in Kentucky. And they found after they got there, they were snake handlers. And uh, part of you know who I'm talking about. But they said that when they picked out the first rattlesnake and they were passing it around, and he said, you know, told to the rest of the group and said, let's go out the back door. And said, one of them said, there isn't any back door. And he said, well, where do you think they want one? <laughs> Amen. That's a faith motivates to action, guys. Amen. Where, where do you think they would want one? You know, and I, I'm, I'm kind of like that. You know, see, would you, don't you believe that? Sign? I sure do. I believe a lot of stuff. You know what I mean? But uh, anyhow, with a heart, man believeth. And I want you to understand, when you believe, you practice. Let's look at it a little bit. Our faith in Christ reassures us of our salvation. We don't have the blood of bulls and goats or calves, but his own blood. By his own blood, 
Look at this, this this admonition to preachers. Take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock of which God hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. How important is the church? Came at a high price, didn't it? And from Christ Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Our, that, that assures us of our own salvation. You understand that? We're not, we don't have some measly little thing. You know, if you do this, this, and this, and this, you get in. You do this, this, and this. What if you don't do this, this, or this? What if you come up short? What if you do one well? We're not talking about meeting with a whole bunch of people who vote on how well you did. It's not a grading system. One day you're going to stand in front of God. How much is enough? You don't know, but I can tell you how much is enough. The shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we have absolute security in, in, our, in our life. We also know, second thing, that Enoch understood the plan of God. So how do you know that? It tells us, Jude chapter 1. Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied these things, saying, The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Not ten thousand, but ten thousands of his saints. He, he knew Jesus was going to come and go and come back. Right? He knew that. Somebody must have told him. You reckon it was God? Sure it was. Moses was able to say, there's going to be another prophet come. He's going to be just like me, but he's going to have the authority that I don't have. And that one. Remember, all, when you read through your New Testament, and they, Jesus said, who do men think I am? And some say, you're that prophet. That's the prophet you're talking about. That prophet that Moses said was coming. That prophet. To execute judgment upon all. Now he knows there's going to be a judgment day. To convince all their ungodly among all their ungodly deeds. He, he understands. And he understands this, guys. He, he knows this plan. God's going to offer something to the world. Somewhere or another, he's got to have this thing coming where there's going to be people that please God. They're going to go to be with God, and God's bringing them back, and then he's going to do the judgment. Look, look, he knows the order. By faith, he trusted his salvation. He believed in the Lord, and the Lord counted to him for righteousness. That's talking about Abraham. That's what we do. We trust the plan of the Lord. We sing about his grace and his mercy and his love and his kindness and it's not changed. When you Somebody said the other day, I heard them say it when they were preaching, they said, we need to pay a lot more attention to what we're paying attention to. Where's your focus been in the last six months? What are you focused on? Well, I can tell you in the world I live in, you better be glad you live in Texas. It's, all, it's one of the few states that has a, an economy halfway running decent. You focus on the wrong things. Everybody suffers. Where's your focus? We, we ought to pay attention to where our attention is focused. Stop and think. What am I thinking about most of the time? Compare it to what the scripture says about you and where your mind should be. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, that we be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Think about what I'm telling you. For what said the scripture? Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, I don't know about you guys. There's a couple of things I never wanted to do. I've never been scared of dying. I, I'll tell you that right up front. Cheryl's had to live with that all of our lives. All right. And for part of you, that just is unreal, isn't it? I, I don't know what to tell you, okay? <sighs> the only thing pretty much in the whole world I'm scared of is Cheryl, okay? <clears throat> but there's certain things I don't want to do. I, I don't want to go out of something's lunch. You know, I think of a lot of ways to die, but being somebody's lunch or something's lunch is not it. Now, when I learned to scuba dive, um, it was a little bit different. 
we just, my brother-in-law, Bob, and I went, we found a garage sale scuba equipment, and we bought it and became scuba divers. And uh, so we got somebody to train us a little bit to know how to put the mouthpiece in, and we just used their stuff and found out years later that you're supposed to get your own mouthpiece and your own goggles and stuff because that was the other person's, but it's too late then. So I snorkeled all my life. You know what snorkeling is? I got the little tube. You take a breath, go under the water, you swim around. I'm pretty good at that. I can stand there for several minutes. You come back up and you don't breathe in again until you blow out. Like that. Okay. Now, my body was trained to do that really well. You put on scuba gear and you go under the water and they make you, they throw all your junk in the pool and you have to go down and assemble it and put it on under the water and put your mouthpiece in your mouth and clear out your goggle and the face mask and all that stuff and take a breath. You know, and I'm in my mind, I know all that, but my body said, uh uh. Mm -mm. You go to the surface and blow this out first and I'll breathe in, but I ain't doing it till then. You know, it was an argument between my brain saying, this is what we do, remember? And the body's going, I ain't doing it. This is what we do, and I ain't doing it, okay? And finally, the brain finally went out, and it worked out pretty well on me. And we, we did a lot of great scuba diving and stuff and all that, and I moved. So we got a chance to go down to the flats in the Keys and did a lot of freshwater stuff, and then we was going to go to the ocean. First time I was ever in the ocean. How many of you ever scuba dived in the ocean? It's, it's wonderful experience. Until you realize there's things out there that will eat you. And in the flats, it's a running area for sharks. Everything, every kind of shark you can ever imagine runs through there. Water's about, I don't know, it's, it's, deep, it's shallow enough, you know, that you can do really good scuba diving in and stuff like that, but it's also great hunting territory. When's the first time you were in the ocean and you realize there was a shark. You said, well, it was a nurse shark. It didn't matter. It was a shark, okay? And he was swimming around you or she. I didn't get that close enough to be able to tell which one they were. You know what I mean? I know part of you do that stuff. But first time I was down there, you got to look. It ain't like looking here and there. you got to look everywhere. They can be below you, above you, around you. I used up all my air in 10 minutes. <laughs> And it took me a couple of times to get it calmed down and realize that they really weren't looking for a guy with a scuba gear on. So I don't know. No, I don't, I don't want to, there, I don't have a plan to how to do that. I can tell you, and I don't want to go out like that. I, I, I promise you. But I, I want you to understand the Christian does not have to fear death. And you say, well, somebody's got a plan to kill us. He's had a plan since the very beginning to kill us. And the only reason we're still here is because, because God is on our side. Go back and sing Martin Luther's song one more time. It's in your hymnal. We fight an enemy that we could not stand against were it not for God being on our side. Abraham believed God. And God accounted to him for righteousness. That's the way me and you were saved. You'll find that written five times in your Bible at different places. For without faith, it's impossible to please him. Enoch must have really believed God. By faith, he understood the security of the saints. If you look down through that, he's going to bring them back with us. And he's going to judge the lost. I know thy works. I've set before thee an open door. Think about this. And no man can shut it. I'm persuaded with all my heart, guys, if Christianity dies in America, it will not be the world that does it. It'll be when Christians follow after the problem at Ephesus. And that is, God said, I'm going to come and take your candlestick away, which was a picture type of the church itself, because you've lost your first love. I'm not the priority in your life. Remember what I went back to and how I begun this? Have you paid attention to what you're paying attention to? What is the number one priority in your life? See, I, I believe Christianity's got to take a real close look. And you can look out there and say Christianity, but see, it starts with, with me. 
They sung a noon song, saying, They're worthy to take the book, to open the seals, for they were slain, has redeemed us to God by thy blood, every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and made us under our God kings, priests, and we shall reign on the earth. You believe that? But I won't do it in this body. See, I know that. By faith, he understood the punishment of the sinners. To execute judgment upon all, convince all that are ungodly among them. He understood the judgment of the sinners. You don't have Christian people who tell me they trust Christ as their Savior. And they're angry at God because they know one of their family members won't get saved. It's just not fair. And they got all these things they've, they've made up everywhere. Jude said that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. But that pleasure, not Jude. Um, I think I'm in the wrong place here. But I should be in the book of first, uh, Second Thessalonians talking about chapters there. But it says, who had pleasure in unrighteousness. And it, and it goes on. Now here's where the verse goes. And all undeceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they believe, love, receive not the truth love of the truth that they might be saved this truth this cause God shall bring them strong delusion they should believe a lie and that they might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness think about you say well preacher <clears throat> you know I just you, do you understand Jude had the coming of the Lord the saving of the people the going to be with the Lord the coming back and the judgments all in order he understood. We also know he understood eternal security. Then cometh the Lord with ten thousands of his saints. I like that. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I don't know if you've thought about this, but Jude, just like Elijah, We'll have to die someday. God raised Lazarus from the dead. Is he still here? Nope. We don't know how, where, when, or what any of that about him, but I mean you all of you know that he's eventually died and he's not in the world anymore. It's appointed unto men once to die. It's not the dying part that's unique. It's where you go when you die. Jude tells us that Enoch knew that the Lord was coming with ten thousands of his saints. So he understood that. And that's eternal security, guys. I don't I don't care what happens between here and there. And we're looking so much between here and there, we've forgotten that you're, you're not getting out of this world alive. You're, just, you're not getting out of here alive. You, you know that, right? We're the most perplexing people in the whole world. We spend our own life as Christians hoping we never die. Yeah, come on. Yeah. How many people have we prayed for? I'm bad as you are. Lord, you know what? I'm, bad. I'm like this, Lord. Don't let him die. He's, he's, he's one of the best helpers I got. You know? Who's, who's going to help me if he's gone? Or who's going to help me when she's gone? You want that? You know, think about me. Have pity on me, God. You know, think about this. But I, I'm like a song I heard this morning on the radio. It said, I think it was Cheryl's, about a man speaking, singing about his mom and dad being gone to heaven and how much he misses them here. But he said, I've never asked you to bring them back. You know, I never asked you to bring them back. And uh, I talked to a person a couple weeks ago that lost his dad and he said you know this his life is different and what would he do and how long do you miss him mm, let's see my dad died in 89 and there's days I still miss him terribly I'm almost to the age that he was when he passed away and I still miss him terribly I remember as a kid thinking you know what I can hardly wait I can hardly wait till I grow up bigger and me and my dad will be grown up together. I didn't realize that every time I got a year older, he got a year older. 
I thought he was going to wait there for me, you know, coming. I'm serious, thinking that's the way a kid thought. I still remember that thinking. We'd bring him back, would we? Ah, ain't no way. And that's what David said. I can't bring him back. I can go to be where he's at. And you would understand that. We know that he understood eternal security. And we understand that Enoch had been walking with God. Now I'm thinking, if you got this down, he's got the best of every world, and so do we. I don't understand my world. I have never understood the world. When I was lost, I didn't understand the world. It was an absolute, I, I don't know what to say. I could not understand it because nothing made sense when you're lost and you're trying to figure out why everybody acts as weird as they do. And why th that people would continue doing the things that destroy their lives and they would do things and, because they have no hope, but they wouldn't look for hope. Now, I don't know, but I'm going to tell you this. And you've heard my testimony a thousand times. The first time somebody told me the answer, the very first time I took it. You mean there's an answer for this? Yes, Jesus. You don't have to be separated from God. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to go through the world all by yourself. You don't have to be hopeless all of your life. You don't have to be miserable. You don't have to be without a reason to have joy and peace in your heart. I, I don't know about everybody else, but I spend a lot of my time around people who know the Lord. And I'm privileged with that. I wonder what people who don't spend time around those folks are like in their lives. No wonder they're drug addicts. We're not angels, but every one of you know what I'm talking about. When I talk to you about Jesus, you know who I'm talking about because he's your Savior too, right? Wonder what the world has to rejoice over. Now, Enoch had already been walking with God, and I have a feeling what he'd been doing, he'd walk with God in the evening. Can you see it? And he'd go home the next day and tell everybody else about it. You, you know what me and God talked about yesterday? So how, how did he do that? Don't know that. I don't know that. I assume that it was a theophany, which would be God in the appearance of flesh, walking and talking to him just like when God appeared all the other times in the Scripture. But he's telling them about it. And he said, you know, one of these days, I hope he just takes me home. Can you see him? I just want to keep going with him and just keep going home, keep going home. And How many of you think they went to look for him? They did for Elijah. Elisha said he's not there. He went up just like God said he was going to do. Four times when, when Elijah and Elisha were walking around together, his disciples said, do you know your master is going to be taken from you today? See, they all knew that. But when he was taken, they said, well, how do we know you didn't just knock him in the head and leave him out there and take his clothes? Seriously, you remember that? He took his mantle and stuff. But they said, he finally, when he was embarrassed, he said, well, go look for him. So they went and looked for him, couldn't find him. I'm thinking when you could walk back across the Jordan River on dry ground, but having the river back up, it ought to be enough sign. You know what I'm saying? I don't think they did. I think they were absolutely assured we know where he's at. He's with God. He was not for God took him. We know that he understood eternal security. You know what eternal security is? It's just believing God. I have all kinds of questions. Do you have those questions? I, I don't, there's thousands of them that come into my mind. I'm, I'm amazed at how isolated people are about reality and life. And every once in a while, somebody will say something about, you know, what, when did this happen? What, you know, when did we start that? And you know, they go, oh, about 1926. Really? Yeah. When did they do that? When did they have this? You know, and you're surprised about stuff. Do you know that if you stick your finger in a light socket, it'll hurt you? 
Yeah, we figured that out a long time ago. Long, long time ago. That's why we put those little plastic things on there so you guys won't do that anymore. Right? We live in a whole world that's just amazed at how it's going. How many of you read in your Bible already? And you already know the answer to that. In the last days, the great falling away, perilous times. Let's see, if I believe in what Enoch believed in, I got to believe in what God said about the time that we're going to go through too as well. And just like his faith carried him off with God, our faith would carry us through with God. If God be for us, who can stand against us? So, well, preacher, you don't know how I'm living my life. God ain't for me. Then get it right. Walk with God. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. And I'm grateful I'm not quite like others that have no hope. You tell me that. I know where my loved ones are. And I know that who you are. And I know what you promised us. Lord, I believe those things. But I look around me, and I'm still surprised that what I already knew is coming to pass. Quicker than I wanted it to. Lord, I'm praying that you give us courage as Christians, just like Enoch. When the opportunity is there, way before he was taken out of the world, he walked with God. He knew things that most people hadn't figured out for another couple thousand years. And because of that, he was as comfortable walking with God in a turbulent time. This is the time right before the flood. Right before the flood. The world had to be that wicked place that the scripture describes it. And yet, Lord, he still had peace in his heart because he walked with God. Help us to have that kind of faith. Help us to be that close to our God. And Lord, we pray that you encourage our hearts. And Lord, help us to be a testimony to others in Christ's name. Amen. Stand with me. Number 159, Jesus, I come. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Into thy freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness, into thy health, out of my want, and into thy wealth, out of my sin, and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. Brother Mike, would you lead us in closing prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the time to come to your house. Lord, for your grace and your mercy. And that, uh, Lord, we just pray that you would help us to walk with you like Enoch. To have that relationship, Lord, on a daily basis. To talk to you and walk with you. And have you by our side. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We praise you for all that you do. Be with those that are on our prayer list. In Jesus' name we pray.